elements were against you. The storm loomed over, a terrifying beast lashing out in lightning strikes and threatening roars of thunder. The oceans of water that crashed onto you from the heavens soaked into your skin and drenched your being so that not even your soul was dry. You forced your feet to dash through the mud, the sludge occasionally turning the ground into a dangerous game of seeing if you could stay on your feet. The branches slapped against your face, your bare arms, leaving behind their marks, scrapes and thinly sliced cuts in their wake. The gale's screams pierce your ears and shove you backwards, like invisible hands doing the bidding of those who hunted you. Despite it all, you ventured against the storm, afraid of the death that awaited you should you stop. A quick glance over your shoulder showed you the torches that would be snuffed out if not for the magic that protected them. And they were too close. With the panic in you spiking, came a stumble and a slip, and you were nearly submerged in mud. I think I heard something over there, came a shout. You scrambled to right yourself, driven by the need to survive. You claw your way up, using a thick tree root nearly as high as your waist, but you were too slow. Even over the thunderous sky and the wind roaring in your ears, you heard the abhorrent signature of your death. An arrow, a paling in its ability to strike true, stab the air and meet its mark through your torso. You let out a shout of pain that was lost to the wind and took forward, slumping over the tree root. Your body is suddenly heavy with agony and exhaustion, but despite it, you crawl forward through the mud a last futile attempt of escaping. The slick thumbs of heavy footsteps caused you to halt in your struggles. Your consciousness slipping, you wonder if the sight before you is a trick of the shadows. But no. Lightning flashes, bringing the egregious figure into focus for one second, outlining a broad and bulky humanoid. Its hands were equipped with long, sinister claws. Fingers flared out in readiness. The bright white illuminated its fangs, large, sharp, and snarling in a low, dangerous threat. In the darkness that followed the flash, two glowing red eyes glared down at you, like two blood moons captured in its irises. The creature took a step forward, its attention focused on you, and you knew there was no hope. It must have smelled your blood and thirsted for easy meat. You had run but death had found you, and left you no means of escape. When the darkness of your blood loss claimed you, thicker than the darkness of the night, you were almost thankful. At least, you would not suffer through the feeling of your limbs being ripped apart. Warmth is the first thing you're aware of. Then, a soft gleam behind your eyelids. Had you actually made it to heaven? That was surprising. You open your eyes gradually, in no hurry for the silver city. Blinking, you notice the fire, a meter or so away from you. And shifting, you see stalagmites above you. Perhaps you'd arrived in hell after all, and this cave was the entrance. Hopefully, you were placed in the first string. The mouth of the cave wasn't in sight, but near enough that you could hear the storm rearing from its lost prey. You feel fluff tickling your exposed skin. You wonder if perhaps someone had draped a blanket over you, and it slipped. As you turn, you think of how the blanket was able to radiate such warmth, before you see how wrong you were. Behind you lay a large wolf with ashy blonde fur. You were fit snugly into the curve of its body. Fear races through you at the sight of the sleeping creature, and your first response is a clear and resounding, get away. You twisted away from the wolf and then let out a loud yelp. A horrid pain erupted in your stomach. So overpowering, you were temporarily paralyzed. The eyes of the beast at your side snapped open and the flurry of motion had you attempting to flee. The desire not to get mauled outweighing the pain. In the midst of your panicked attempt, a large clawed hand pressed down on your stomach. 
forcing you to stillness. You whimper at the new pressure, causing ripples of agony. Would you stop moving? It will start bleeding again. The wolf was no longer there. In its place, hovering over you, was a man, or rather, almost a man. He had ashy, unkempt hair and molten ruby eyes that glared down at you, daring you to move. His teeth hinted to you from beneath his lips, and the sharp edges of his claws teased your skin, making you aware that he was not human, and that he was indeed dangerous. He wore only a pair of ragged pants, his chest toned and broad and fully on display. The man had no regard for your modesty when he rashly pulled up your shirt and examined the wound beneath. He growled lowly with irritation. There, you've gone and done it. You're bleeding again. He then pressed his hand over your wound, causing you to lurch to escape his grip. You're hurting me. You plead for him to stop. Would you rather bleed out and die? He scoffed. Tears prick your eyes, and you try to take deeper breaths to combat the pain. Eventually, the creature let up on his grip and peered down to the wound. You let out a breath in relief. He said, matter-of-factly, these bandages need to be changed. Then he is away from you, rummaging through the satchel cast on the floor. You look up at him as you pant for breath. Realizing the similarities with the silhouette of the beast in the forest and the man before you. Are you the creature from the forest? You ask. I'm not no fucking creature. I'm Bakugo Katsuki. Bakugo shouted angrily. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. You say quietly, hoping not to offend him again. Bakugo scoffed. Please, like a little thing like you could affect me. You brush off his obvious insult and instead question, Why did you save me? Bakugo returned to your side, bandages haphazardly in his hand. He dragged his knife-like nail across the bandages on your torso, ripping them in swiftness and odd carefulness. I wanted to know why you led them here. How do you know about this place? He interrogated. You look around and wonder what was so special about this dingy cave. What, your home? Katsuki narrowed his eyes in suspicion. You don't know where you are? Sorry, no, you answer honestly. I was just trying to get away from them. They were trying to kill me, if you hadn't noticed. Katsuki peered down at you with a distrustful glare. You stare up, worried that Katsuki would lash out if he felt you show any signs of deceit, even if you were telling the truth. A soft tingling alerted you to another presence. From behind a stalagmite, a creature glowing green fluttered above you before descending like a delicate flower onto your chest. Deku, what are you doing? Katsuki demanded. You gazed down at the little thing, mesmerized. The creature was no bigger than your hand, his hair a collection of green curls that reminded you of the cinnamon ferns that decorated the palace. He sat firmly at your chest, peering at you with open scrutiny. For his small frame, those tiny eyes like carefully cut emeralds, stared at you so intently that they seemed wider than his entire body. He emitted a bright green glow, flattering his features and dusting your skin. You're a fairy, you say in your days. How perceptive of you, Katsuki said sarcastically. You could not force your eyes away from the creature's gaze. Despite his size, his irises seemed to hold the most beautiful auroras. Then he opens his mouth, and a tiny whispering breaks you from your trance. Katsuki glares down so intensely, you fear the creature would burst into flames. But he doesn't. You watch as the creature puffs his cheeks in an almost stubborn gesture, and stares at Katsuki. What is he saying? You ask transfixed by the exchange. Deku thinks we can trust you, he says in a condescending manner that proved Katsuki did not share that sentiment. Deku, as Katsuki called him, then pointed at your exposed wound and crossed his arms in cute anger. 
Kaski growled at the fairy. I was going to rebandage them before you decided to fly in. Deku turned to you, whispering inaudibly. Though you couldn't hear him, the way he spoke calmed you and reminded you of dandelions drifting in an early spring breeze. You're sad that you couldn't understand his words. Deku seemed to realize this and then turns to Katsuki expectantly. Katsuki growls as he bandages you, possibly lifting you to wrap the cloth around your waist securely. Do I look like a fucking translator to you? Deku puffs and Katsuki rolls his eyes. Deku says that he's sorry for my behavior, whatever the fuck that means. How can you hear him? My entire being is superior to any human, Katsuki says superstitiously. Another wave of miniature whisperings from Deku, and Katsuki snarled. Shut it, Deku, I don't care. Deku puffed again and flopped down onto your chest, his little hair bouncing with him. Katsuki finished with a forceful tug that caused you to wince. Deku glanced at you, his eyes wide with concern. Then whispered to Katsuki. Katsuki immediately yelled, No! But the fairy persisted, his mouth moving a mile a minute, with every passing minute making Katsuki bristle with irritation. What's going on? you ask, a little afraid that Katsuki would attack Deku. Deku wants me to show you what this place really is. You could tell that Katsuki was livid at the idea, so you mediate with Deku. It's all right, I don't need to know. I just need to rest for a bit, and I'll find somewhere else to hide. You couldn't help the octaves your voice drops. Afraid if you breathe too harshly, Deku would be blown away. Deku then frantically started to whisper to Katsuki, his voice now loud enough to come in squeaks, his tiny arms like the thinnest branches of a bush waving animatedly at the wolf. Oh, for fuck's sake, Deku, shut up! Fine, get up, human, I'll show you. You try to sit up gingerly, but gasp at a sharp twist. Deku kicks off you and zooms to Katsuki. His adorable, indignant squeaks are back. What the fuck am I supposed to do? Katsuki shouts back. Carry them? It's fine, it's fine, you say. Not much for conflict. I think I can walk. Do you have a stick, maybe? Deku puffs his cheeks and Katsuki snarls. Then he comes to you and pulls you up rashly. You try hard not to yelp, but can't help the little sound in your throat. Deku flies in front of Katsuki with more angry whisperings. You said help. I'm helping. What else do you want from me, you flying rat? I think he meant help gently, you say, combating the pain. Katsuki rolled his eyes and said with a demeaning tone, Humans are awfully weak. You're thus disabled from one arrow. You were offended by that, because in no means had you gone down easy. I also had to run in a storm for miles, you defend. Tuh, that's nothing. I could run that has a light morning jog, he replies arrogantly. You sulk with these words, and Deku flies in front of him. You hear the frustrated whispers again. Katsuki growls at the little fae. I am not being rude, they're being a wump. I am not, you shout. Yes, you are. Now are you going to lean on me, wump, or walk by yourself? You huff and then straighten, feeling your muscles pull and contract in an uncomfortable way. But out of spite, you said, I'll walk on my own. You take an experimental step, your body chiding you for your pride. But nevertheless, you lean on the stalagmites and take cautious steps forward. You hear Deku's angry whispers behind you and Katsuki snarling in frustration. Then clawed hands yank you sideways. Katsuki grits his teeth. Come on. No, I'm not weak. Right, right, you're not weak. Come on, Katsuki says tightly and clutches your hand in his, guiding you through the cave. Deku flies by landing on Katsuki's shoulder looking proud. The three of you arrive at a strange waterfall, falling in an oddly well-cut-out archway. Beyond the curtain of waterfall seems to be a hollow opening in the cave. 
It would be a dead end to any passerby wandering the cave. And yet, that was where Kotsky stopped. A little muffed by the sight, you ask, where is the water coming from? Deku fluttered in front of you, whispering what you think is an explanation, before Kotsky says gruffly, They can't hear you, idiot. Deku's entire body droops, except his wings still keeping him fluttering. You smile kindly and say, Thanks anyway, Deku. It's a protective barrier, Kotsky explains. It only lets in those with pure intentions. I suppose, if you were telling the truth back there, it will let you pass. But if you weren't... Before he finished his sentence, you pushed through the water. It was a weird feeling, expecting to be wet, but only having a cool vapor-like substance skim your skin. Like cool air surrounding ice. You'd closed your eyes instinctively, and when you'd opened them again, the sight you saw stole your breath away. There, beyond the gateway, was every beautiful thing created by nature. There was lush green grass, fresher than you'd seen spring grant you. Large oak trees beautified and strengthened with age. You couldn't see the sky beyond the cave, but the warmth of the air encapsulated spring rather than the harsh winter that lay beyond. The oasis stretched further than your eyes could venture, but you stared with wonder seeking more of its beauty as far as you could reach. Thus, Katsuki said, is a fairy sanctuary.